It's that wonderful time of the offseason. It's time for player evaluations. And we've done a lot of Paolo Bancaro, so that may be the official first player evaluation. But we're going to do a big one again today. We're going to talk about Franz Wagner and how being really good at what you're already good at is growth, even if it's not the growth we want or we think we want. We'll get to it. It's time for Locked On Magic. You are Locked On Magic. Your daily Orlando magic podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And you are indeed Locked On Magic. Today is May 2nd, 2023. My name is Philip Rossenreich. I'm the expert insight editor over at orlandomagicdaily.com. Of course, follow me on Twitter at philiprr underscore omd. On today's episode of Lockdown Magic, we're going to dive into all things Franz Wagner as we discuss his season and what to make of a sophomore season that was a lot of what was really good last year, but maybe not everything that we wanted it to be. We'll dive a little bit into that and discuss what the future holds for the Magic's sophomore forward coming up here in just a moment. But first, we want to thank you again for making Locked On Magic part of your day every day, no matter when you listen to us, whether it's first thing in the morning, whether it's right when we upload. We truly appreciate you making Locked On Magic part of your day. Remember, there's a great Locked On podcast covering every single thing in the NBA. Just search for Locked On and the team you're looking for, the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Today's podcast is brought to you by the Game Time app. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Franz Wagner is a player that that, on one hand, does everything that you want a young player to do. There is not a thing that doesn't get you excited about Franz Wagner and what he is capable of. He does so many things well that that honestly, oftentimes, you don't even notice all the things that he's doing well and all the things that he's contributing to your team. And on the other hand, though, he is someone that I think everyone around the league recognizes is a potential future all-star but he doesn't always play like it. It, You almost have to like drag that part out of him. And he certainly doesn't act like the star. He doesn't act like the best player. He he seems like he is still figuring out how to find his place or or what he's comfortable with. And and pushing him out of his comfort zone is still one of, I think, the big things that the Magic are going to have to do with Franz Wagner and and figure out a way to, to help him grow. Because... The baseline of what Franz Wagner is, and I think we said this last year after his rookie season, if Franz Wagner stays what he is this year, that's still a really good player. That's still a fantastic player. Franz Wagner could stop growing, could stop developing, and he is already a player that's going to contribute to a winning team, a player that's going to make his teammates better, a player that's going to make his team better, and it's going to help his team win. There is no denying, and and, and every number suggests this, the Magic are better with Franz Wagner on the floor. You can track the counting stats, you can ignore the counting stats, but every number, every metric suggests the Magic are better with Franz Wagner on the floor. Take any lineup that Franz Wagner is in and take Franz Wagner out of that lineup, and that lineup is probably worse. I, I don't think there is a single lineup that is made made better without Franz Wagner in it. Um, and only taking out Franz Wagner, you know, maybe make some other changes and it's, I don't know. And, and honestly, that is the highest compliment you can give. The bottom line, before any, you talk about any other part and, and maybe, and, and we'll spend the second segment maybe talking a little bit about, a little bit more about what we hoped to see from Franz Wagner perhaps and whether he met those expectations or, or how he can reach those expectations. Before we get any anywhere else, Franz Wagner got better this season. His rookie year, he averaged 15.2 points per game. 
His second year, he averaged 18.6. He averaged 2.9 assists per game his rookie year, 3.5 his second. He shot 46.8% from the floor his rookie year, 48.5% his sophomore year. 35.4% from deep, 36.1% his sophomore year. The only place where he didn't get better is his free throw percentage. 86.3% 86.3% on 2.8 attempts per game to 84.2% on 4 attempts per game. A good bump up. And his rebounding, which he's not a good rebounder. 4.5 rebounds per game to 4.1 rebounds per game. There is no universe that we do not call Franz Wagner's sophomore season a, a smashing success. I hinted at this, and this is ultimately my conclusion about Franz Wagner. Um, we saw this at Eurobasket. We saw this in the regular season. Franz Wagner was simply better at all the things he was really good at his rookie year. And and honestly, that's valuable. There are other things that we want him to get to, but let's start there. Let's start with that statement. Franz Wagner was better at the things he is already good at. The things that he is already, quite simply, dominant at. The things that made him an all-rookie first-team player, he was better at it. And, you know, at least to some people, and I think you could make this argument, he was the best sophomore in the league. The consistency, the ability to, to, to fit in wherever his team needed him to, to still contribute at a high level. This is what Franz Wagner delivered his sophomore season, his second season. This is what he gave the Orlando Magic. And look, that's still really valuable. Again, we'll get to maybe some of the things that we wanted to see from him that maybe we didn't, that maybe we will down the road. But start from this place. That just Franz Wagner was better at the things he's already good at. There are still holes to fill, but he's better at that. The one area, though, that I think he really did take a a huge leap this year was with his defense. The numbers don't... The numbers may disagree on this. According to basketball references, defensive box plus minus was minus 0.3 last year, minus 0.5 this year. Magic's defense was better this year. Um, He was a positive offensively from minus 0.4 to 0.4. Defensive win shares jumped from 1.9 to 2.3. There are... There's at least some evidence that he was a better defender. Uh, Statistically, watching the eye test... Franz Wagner was better defensively. It just, I think he's got this really sound. He just makes smart decisions. He's good in rotations. Put him on, you know, put him on whoever his guy is. He may not completely lock him up, but he's going to make him work. And, and I think the numbers bear that out too, where Franz Wagner's defense was really well, was, was really good throughout the course of the season. And, and really, the only place where I think he struggled defensively was at the beginning of the season when the Magic played him at shooting guard and he had to play quicker two guards. And I think that that's where he really struggled. This season for Franz Wagner was very much about being better at what he's good at. Establishing his base, establishing the place where he is going to grow. We saw that play out in Eurobasket. Dennis Schroeder was still the guy, he was still the one carrying that team. But Franz Wagner was comfortable. He was confident. And that carried over into the regular season. That carried over into him being a player that this team could really trust. A player who knew exactly what was expected of him and exactly what he was good at. He was an elite finisher at the rim. He took some of the toughest shots at the basket and he still finished at the rim exceptionally effectively. And his ability to get to the basket is one of his greatest strengths. Just as much as we'd like to see him maybe add a mid-range game to keep defenses off balance, as much as we'd like to see him uh, continue to get to the line a lot more, to add, to have, to give Paolo at least someone else who can get to the line five, six times a game, Franz Wagner delivered in so many ways. He delivered what we've, what we're already expecting from him, and he'll continue to get better at a lot of these things. But there's another story to this Franz Wagner thing. And while the season was undoubtedly a success for him, and, and, and he does not deserve a failing grade, he didn't really even deserve criticism because he was still really good. 
there's another level that he needs to get to. And that was constantly hinted out this season too. And so while he is a great facilitator, while he is a guy that connects the team and makes them work at a level that's frankly intangible sometimes, there's still more that the Magic need from Franz Wagner. And that's going to be the storyline moving forward for him. That's going to be the story that we're going to follow throughout the offseason and, of course, into next season. We'll talk a little bit about what to, what to expect there coming up here in just a moment. But first, a quick word from our friends at Game Time. We all have that big event that we want to get to. I'm eyeing a couple theater events. There's obviously Orlando City Games coming up here in Central Florida. We all have that big event we want to go to, but we sometimes forget to get tickets. So if you need last-minute ticket, last-second tickets, last-minute tickets, don't stress Game Time has you covered. Buying tickets to your favorite events should not be stressful, and Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the event you all have fun at. Browse through the game. I, I browse through the Game Time app. I'm starting to keep an eye on some events that I'm looking forward to, and I'm just amazed with all the deals and all the possibilities. Game Time is the place for last-minute ticket deals. Forget planning months in advance. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the day of day of event. You can get exclusive flash deals too on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and a whole lot more. The Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price if you find tickets in the same section and row for less. Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So, what is there to say about Franz Wagner? Why is there this pause when it comes to him? Um, you know, look, Magic fans are all in on Franz Wagner. They love the guy. We love the guy. I, I'm not here to, to, to throw too much shade. Um, you know, over at AlignedMagicDaily.com, um, you know, our writer came at Franz Wagner from a different angle. Um, and, and I appreciate the different angle. And, and, and I think he gave him a pretty harsh grade personally because I thought Franz had a great season. Again, he was just better at the things he was already good at. But by the same token, I, I had to agree some with his argument that, yes, Franz's numbers went up. Yes, he did all these things. But he didn't necessarily grow or, or expand his game. He grew. He got better. He's better, again, my big theme on Franz Wagner this year is he's, he got better at the things he was already pretty darn good at. But his game didn't expand. You know, we sat here, we sat throughout last season, we sat throughout this season, asking a lot of the same questions. Wanting Franz Wagner to take more shots. And look, Franz Wagner took more shots. I, I, I kind of hated that argument last year because I was like, guys, Franz Wagner was still second on the team in field goal attempts. His field goal attempts went up from 12.3 per game to 14 per game this year. This three-point attempts, again, 3.4 to 4.5. Gets that up to 6 or 7. That's kind of what we're looking for from three-point shooting. And maybe Franz is that guy to be a little bit more of a volume shooter uh, from deep especially, but it's not like Franz Wagner isn't getting any shots. But yet, it, I, I can't argue that the criticism remains. That at times, it did not feel like Franz Wagner was involved enough in the offense. That at times, it felt like we were waiting for Franz Wagner to do something. Uh, or we were saying, hey, get the ball to Franz. Like something you had to be forceful of. And a lot of some of this is the Magic's offense and the nature of the Magic's offense that yes, guys can sometimes get lost in the shuffle. But some of it is that, that old argument about Franz Wagner that he doesn't involve himself in the offense. Look, Eurobasket was a revelation. And, and it was a revelation because of the way that Wagner played. He not only did all the things that he was really good at with Orlando, but we saw him introduce some more of that isolation game. And look, he's still getting to the basket. He can still attack closeouts. He still attacks plenty. 
But we saw him really become more assertive himself and look for his own shot at times. And that was something that the Magic sometimes couldn't draw out of him. In fact, look no further than the evolution of his Dirk Nowitzki shot, of his Dirk Nowitzki fadeaway. In Eurobasket, at the beginning of the season, Wagner was hitting that Euro that 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 Dirk step back. You know, one legged, you know, kind of stop, pull back on one leg, hit the hit this like this kind of like giant fadeaway shot over smaller defenders. He was nailing those, you know, t- twice every three games. But by the middle of the season, that shot was gone. You know, it's it's evolution here. And I think that's what we're waiting to see from Franz Wagner is evolution. Is saying, okay, you can get to the basket whenever you want. How about you draw a foul? You know, he's he's very good. His footwork is incredible. He's very good at avoiding contact, learning how to bait contact because he's strong enough to still finish at the rim and still get to the rim. Learning how to bait contact is going to take him from 18.6 to 21, 22 points per game. Starting to integrate the mid-range jumper and look for mid-range jumpers because he's earned the right to take mid-range jumpers. He's a good mid-range jump shooter. He just never takes them because, again, getting the basket so easy for him. That's going to take him from 18.6 to 21, 22 to 24, 25. Any criticism we have of Franz Wagner and, and the way that he plays is born out of a confidence that he can do it, that he can be a star player. And for a guy like Wagner, the only one keeping him from being a superstar in this league, from being a star in this league, is himself. Because he's already really good. Again, I'm not here to tell you Franz Wagner had a bad season. He had a great season. But we're thinking about evolution. We're thinking about what comes next. For Paolo Bancaro, we know that's being more efficient and being smarter and more deliberate and understanding what a good shot is and what a bad shot is. Franz Wagner knows implicitly what a good shot is. We want him to sometimes take bad shots because we have confidence that he can make it and he'll make good decisions. We want him to look for his own a little bit more, and that's kind of against his nature. He is very much like Jonathan Isaac. I I often describe Jonathan Isaac as if that man had any ego, he would have been the first pick in his draft class with Marco Fultz, with Jason Tatum, if that man had any ego, he, like there's no stopping him. It's just the, ta- the talent level uh, and, and the size and the ability is, is off the charts. And obviously the injuries slowed that down but and, and slowed down what we expected of him. But nonetheless, that's where I'm at with Franz Wagner. I don't want Franz to stop being a team player. Don't get me wrong. But I want to see him take over. I want to see him being willing to search for his shot a little bit more. To demand the ball when he hasn't gotten a touch in a while. And again, that's somewhat on the point guards and and a lot of other things. But for the Magic, it's about pushing him out of his comfort zone. It's about challenging him to reach this next level. To, To do what the team needs, obviously. You trust him to make good decisions. But to push him beyond what he's already good at. We know what he's good at, and he's really good at it. It's not going anywhere. But now it's about pushing him beyond it. I really do think, as bad as that 5-20 and 20 start was, and as much as it cost Orlando in the playoffs, in the, in the postseason chase, that 5-20 and 20 start was really a blessing. Because it pushed... Paolo Bencaro to be a ball handler a little bit more and tested his passing ability. We could really begin to see that. But it was a blessing for Franz Wagner as much as anyone else because it pushed him, it forced the magic to push him out of his comfort zone, to make him do something that he is not used to doing. He had to run point. And look, he struggled bringing the ball up. I'm not going to sit here and deny that. Turnovers jumped from 1.5 to 2.1 for the season. He struggled in that role. But he is a smart enough player that he can figure it out. He's a smart enough player that he will find his center and find what he can do. And we saw that, yes, he can handle the ball a little bit, that he can be that primary player, that he can help 
get this team moving in the right direction. And for the Magic, yeah, lean on what he's good at. But for Franz Wagner as he enters this offseason, again, he's got another trip uh, to, to, for international play. He'll play in the FIBA World Cup, provided that he's healthy in, in, in August and September. The Magic still need to find ways to push him out of his comfort zone. To make him at least a little uncomfortable. To help him expand his game. That's really the only criticism I have. To Now that you've mastered what you're good at, and you will continue to master what you're good at, how does your game expand? How does it get better? How does it grow and balloon? Those are the big questions left for Franz Wagner. And this season was a success, but we didn't see Franz become quite the star that we all hoped he would be. And instead, we we're all asking a lot of the same questions, and again, more confidently perhaps, because Franz is more confident too, asking a lot of the same questions about what his ultimate role can be and what kind of player, honestly, he wants to be. We're going to do our daily lottery spin plus talk about Monday's action in the NBA playoffs. We'll get to that coming up here in just a moment. But first, a quick word from our friends over at Prize Picks. Prize Picks has this great deal the $1 million daily super flex promotion throughout the NBA playoffs. Every day of the NBA playoffs into the NBA finals, one Prize Picks user will win a chance to, at becoming a millionaire. One entry placed after 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time will be randomly selected each day. And whoever placed that entry will be given a six pick flex with the following payouts. Four correct picks will get you $16,000. Five correct picks gets you $80,000. Six correct picks gets you $1 million. Full details can be found at prizepicks.com slash million. You must opt in at this link to be eligible for the million dollar entry. Once you opt in, all you have to do is play the game like normal and you could be the lucky winner. Price picks is daily fantasy done right. You're not playing up against... Uh, a bunch of people, you're not in these gigantic pools where you're hoping to get your money back and just throwing money away. You're going up against the house. You're going up against the projected numbers. And it's really, really simple to play. All you have to do is project, is predict what players are going to do in each game. You pick two to six of those entries and you can win 25 times your money in addition to having the chance at this million dollar super flex. There's no competing against other people, just you versus the projections, and they offer projections in any sports you think of. NBA, MLB, NHL, PGA, eSports, WNBA, NASCAR, you name it, they probably have it. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's really that easy. They offer safe and fast withdrawals. They're currently operational in more than 30 states, including Florida, as well as Canada. Download the PrizePix app or go to prizepix.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First-time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match of up to $100 with promo code locked on. If you deposit $100, Price Picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, Price Picks will give you $50. Don't forget to enter promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match of up to $100. So busy and fun night in the NBA uh, as Eastern as the conference semifinals, the second round of the playoffs gets underway. Game game one in the Philadelphia-Boston series lived up to the hype. Um, this series is going to be a lot of fun, and Philadelphia made it abundantly clear that they are here to play. They are here to stay. They are not going to back down from the mighty Boston Celtics. They don't care that they're huge underdogs while Joel Embiid's out. This Philly team is different. Um, this, this Philly team is different than any Philly team that Joel Embiid has played with. They really, I think this team really believes in each other and believes what they're capable of doing, and they played like it. Um, not a lot of defense being played, and I think that speaks more to Boston than it does Philadelphia. Philadelphia was just scrambling, and Doc Rivers said it best after the game. We felt like if we could get to the fourth quarter, we would have a chance to win the game. And James Harden delivered a vintage performance, a career playoff high, 45 points, including the game-winning three with about eight seconds left to give Philadelphia a two-point lead. Worse than that, though, Boston just looked scared. Um, I, I've not seen this team look scared. No one wanted to shoot. No one wanted to, to make that play. They were missing shots. You could see them get tight. And honestly, even on that last possession, 
just trying to do too much, trying to be a little too unselfish. Someone had to make the play. Someone had to make the shot. Marcus Smart had the ball in his hands. He tried, instead of going for a layup, you know, with the defense drawn to him, he tried to dump it down to Jason Tatum. Tatum wasn't ready for it, fumbled it out of bounds. The Celtics don't even get a shot off uh, to win the game. The fact of the matter is what, what, what's happened with Boston in this game, as well as what happened in the Atlanta series, is something we're familiar with. Um, you know, I, I, I joked with the person I was watching the game with that, you know, this is, this, Eddie, this is exactly what Eddie House was talking about. Um, I know that's, I know Magic fans kind of take it as a sore subject, but this is the scenario that Eddie House warned about when Orlando beat Boston in, consec- in consecutive games uh, up at TD Garden back in January. And, and look, those are in December. Huge wins for the Orlando Magic. Probably the biggest wins of the season. I haven't ranked my top 10, 10 games of the season yet. That was probably the biggest win of the season for the Orlando Magic. Um, a, a game that really gave this team like supreme belief in what they are capable of doing. Um, but you know, obvi- you know, one of the things that you know we all talked about, talked about, and, and joked about, and you know, took offense to was you know Eddie House said on 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 the NBC Boston uh, sport uh, broadcast post game that you know Boston can't lose to teams like Orlando. Boston can't lose to teams at the bottom of the standings at home the way that they did. And, you know, Orlando fans took a... I, I'm, I'm probably paraphrasing, paraphrasing what he said incorrectly. Orlando fans rightly took offense to it. The team took offense to it. Um, you know, I think they, I think he dismissed the Magic as a, a, a potentially dangerous team a little too too easily. You know, didn't give the team perhaps a, a, a little bit of respect that they, that they deserve, certainly for beating Boston twice. And the Ma- Magic players had a lot of fun at that expense. But at the same time, um, Eddie House was 100% right that evening about what Boston's ultimate problem is. They don't take their opponents seriously. They don't play with the right intensity. Al Horford, I think, said it after, um, after the game. We didn't defend. They didn't feel us all night. I'm expecting a better defensive game on, on Wednesday when they play game two. Um, but he's 100% right. They did not feel them. Their defense was frankly non-existent. And that's how this game was played. That's how Philadelphia won this game. They did not have to worry so much about the team they were facing. They ran their offense. They made plays. Like Boston let, no offense to Philadelphia, they earned the win. Boston let an inferior team hang around. With the way Boston was shooting the ball, with the with the fact that they never fouled Philadelphia at all during the game, uh, essentially, Boston let them hang around, and they got burned, and they've been continually burned by teams like this. I think I saw the stat from ESPN: Boston has lost more games when they were double-digit favorites than any team in NBA history, at least since they started tracking betting lines. At least, at least in, in NBA in NBA and ESPN's uh, betting line database, that is insane. That you can lose games like this so so frequently, and that, that I think that is a bigger problem with Boston. Now, I don't think Boston's panicking. They had these problems last year. They they went up and down. They played up and down to their competition. These kind of games tend to focus them a little bit. Um, certainly, focus them after they lost to Atlanta in Game Five. They went out in Game Six, took care of business. These these kind of games do tend to focus Boston a little bit. So we'll see if. That helps them. They got to tie the series up. It's obviously a must-win game in Game Two. You don't want to go to Philadelphia with the potential that Joel Embiid will be ready for Game Three. Uh, on the Western side, Denver, Phoenix, uh, another like really fantastic game. It obviously sucks that Chris Paul got hurt, but this was a complete opposite. All about defense. All about the grind. And you know, I think the question that everyone had about Denver is whether they could play the grind because that's an offensive-minded team. But when teams start to take away some of your pieces offensively, can you dig out wins? And this is a game where Denver, Denver looks like a championship team. You know, I, I'm, I, I, had, I had my doubts about them too, but Denver's deep. They got great shooters. KCP came up with big plays. Bruce Brown, one of my favorite free agent targets for the Magic, um, came up with big shots. Nikola Jokic was great. Jamal Murray stuck with stuck with what he had, um, and Denver just knows Phoenix does not have the weapons to stop them. Denver knows. Outside of Durant, outside of Booker, and especially now that Chris Paul's out, Phoenix does not have offensive weapons. 
They're not afraid of campaign. They're not afraid of Damian Lee. They're not afraid of DeAndre Ayton. This series is going to turn on DeAndre Ayton. Is DeAndre Ayton going to play big? Is he going to be a presence? Is he going to give them something offensively? Because right now, Jokic is destroying him. He is taking him to the wood chipper. He is doing whatever he wants on both ends of the floor. Fascinating series, both. Uh, obviously, we got more fascinating games coming up tomorrow. We're really excited for the Golden State LA game, especially. Uh, we will see what that has in store for us. Let's let's do our daily lottery spin to close the show. Um, remember, we're doing our community mock draft on Orlando Magic Daily. I'm posting Twitter polls at Omagic Daily. Just scrub through my timeline. You might have to click on the mentions the way I have it set up. Um, but uh, be sure you're following at Omagic Daily. I'll be posting polls. I'm doing it roughly every six hours or so. So I think the next, I think my first poll ends at 10:30 a.m. ish. Uh, my, the, the poll for pick number two ends around 10:30 a, a.m. ish. Um, we'll be, I'll be put it posting a poll for the third pick uh, shortly after I wake up, probably. Um, but here's today's lottery spin. Um, first one that we've had where the Magic moved down pretty significantly. San Antonio gets the first pick. Utah the second pick. David Locke will like that. Uh, Charlotte gets the third pick. Washington fourth. So that pushes Orlando down to eight and eleven. Um, you know, again. The way, I've, uh, the way I've been doing my mock drafts, my number one priority is good shooting. You know, if, if Grady Dick's there at eight, you know, even with Taylor Hendricks there, even with the, the hope of, you know, knowing that there are some shooters that I really like at 11, I think you take the best shooter in this draft. Um, if Grady Dick is available at eight or, or at six or wherever, I really think you really seriously consider taking him. Now, um, I got criticized a little bit because I, I passed on Almond Thompson. Um, you know, if Amin Thompson slips, if Asar Thompson slips, if uh, Cam Whitmore slips, do you go for the short th- or the short or thing uh, with the shooting from Grady Dick, or do you go for one of those those players that could be a little bit more of a dynamic scorer? Um, I don't think I do it for Cam Whitmore because um, his shooting is really concerning, and in college numbers, I trust. For one of the Thompson twins, the difficulty of this draft is I, I, st- I don't know what to make of the Thompson Twins. I, I need to watch some more tape. Um, I know I say that every time I, I come to these draft these draft questions. Um, I like Asar from what I've seen more than Amend, and that's just because shooting matters to me. I don't think the Magic should make any move this this offseason without considering shooting. Um, you know, I'm fine taking Taylor Hendricks. He's a great shooter. I'd honestly take Taylor Hendricks over Jairus Walker, even though I think Jairus Walker is a really smart player, would be a great connector for any team, you know, cl- kind of close to, you know, kind of the Draymond Green of this draft or in that particular role. Hendricks is a solid defender, not going to drive a ton, not going to get you, not going to, not going to dominate there. He can shoot a little bit. Um, he can protect the rim a little bit. I-, I think he would be really, really valuable. So I'd be fine taking him with that first pick and then going Jordan Hawkins or Keontae George with that second pick. But, I don't have Kim Whitmore off my board. Don't make. I don't want it to sound like that. I am lower on guy. I'm lower on Amin Thompson. I'm lower on Asar Thompson. I'm lower on Cam Whitmore because for the Magic, shooting matters. Now, Asar Thompson really came on strong with the shooting later in the draft. So I have Asar Thompson as the top top player in that grouping of players between Amin, Cam Whitmore, Asar Thompson uh, because shooting matters. Uh, we talk about a lot here. Shooting matters. Um, so that's that's kind of my thought process on the draft right now. And as, I, as I'm putting together my big board, as I'm doing some of these mock drafts, um, that's that's kind of where uh, I am sitting at the moment. Well, we'll talk plenty more about this um, in the days in the days ahead for sure. So we'll 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 get we'll get to all that uh, coming up here. Be sure to participate in the community mock draft. I'm really excited for this project. Leave me your reasons for who you're who you're voting for. Um, we're we're going to have a lot of fun with this. I'll put this together for an article and we'll discuss some of the findings here on the podcast as well. But that's going to do it for me today. I want to thank you all again for listening to today's episode of Locked on Magic. You, of course, find me on Twitter at philiprr underscore omd. Subscribe to the podcast and Apple Podcasts. Switch your tune in Himoy, Google Play, Spotify, Odyssey, and all the places on the podcast to your podcast enabled listening device. For the latest on the Orlando Magic, be sure to check out orlandomagicdaily.com. Be sure to follow us there on Twitter at omagicdaily. We want to thank you again for listening to today's episode of, of Locked on Magic. We appreciate you everydayers who listen to the podcast every single day. We're continuing player evaluations. We'll talk uh, probably about Wendell Carter on tomorrow's episode. I'm still kind of writing that up, still gathering some thoughts on Wendell Carter's season. We'll get to Wendell Carter on tomorrow's episode of Locked on Magic, so be sure to tune in for that. But 
Until then, for Orlando Magic Daily and Locked On Magic, this has been Philip Rossman-Reich. We'll see you all again next time for another episode of Locked On Magic.